Hello, everyone, and welcome to Waterfront Church's first ever uh, all virtual worship service. Uh, just for the record, we are no stranger to doing uh, an online live stream on Sunday mornings, uh, but this is the first time our entire congregation is going to be meeting uh, through a virtual setting. If you are watching us through Facebook Live, I'd like to ask you right now to place in the comments section where it is that you're watching from. One of the awesome things about our God is that He is so big and so powerful uh, that no matter where we are, we are able to connect with Him and He hears us uh, when we cry out to Him. I think that when we look down through the comments section, it's going to be a pretty powerful thing to be reminded just how big the reach of our God is. I want to share with you a verse today that comes from Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. It says in Philippians 4, 6, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. There are many of you watching this today that may be at a time of great anxiety, concerned about all the different things that are happening in the world uh, because of what's been taking place with the coronavirus. I want to remind you that Scripture tells us the antibiotic for anxiety is not just prayer, but prayer with thanksgiving. When we remember that our hope doesn't lie in governments or principalities, uh, it doesn't even lie in uh, how much money we have in our bank account or uh, even the people that we get to be around every day. Our hope rests in the promises of Almighty God that He is in charge, that He is in control, and that He will uphold us with His righteous right hand. When we are able to look and preserve that hope, uh, then it just makes the anxiety begin to slip away. These services on Sunday mornings are going to be so important for us as we gather virtually together to remember God is the one guiding the ship, and he desires good things for his people. Um, our president also, a couple of days ago, asked that today be a national day of prayer. Um, just for the record, I thought this was a great nod to churches like ours uh, that we're having to meet virtually uh, over, the, uh, uh, over the Internet. I would like to lead us in a prayer today uh, as we get started in our worship experience. Let me pray for us. Father God, thank you so much for this day and for all your blessings in it. Thank you for the chance that we've had to gather together on all different ends of the earth to worship you. Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit today wherever we are. And Lord, that we might be reminded that you are sovereign, all-powerful, and that you are in control, even when it seems like things are spiraling elsewhere. Lord, I pray specifically for those who are navigating a time uh, where they don't know where their next paycheck is going to come from. I pray that you would provide for them supernaturally uh, through, again, uh, connections that they have, that we would take care of our fellow man. And Lord, we also pray for our government and political officials that are making decisions that affect all of us. Give them your great wisdom. And Lord, I pray that even through this uncertain time, I pray that there would be testimonies and stories of your greatness in how you provided. Help us to be the hands and feet and the mouthpiece of Christ to one another. God, we love you. Thank you that no matter what happens, that there is nothing that can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Be with us as we worship you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, wherever you are, let's stand together as we worship Almighty God. I've got a reason, I've got a reason to sing and celebrate. Sing 
and celebrate. I was bought by his blood and amazing grace. I've got a reason to sing and celebrate. I was bought by his blood and amazing grace. The Lord has promised good to me. His word my hope secure he will share and portion be as long as life endures through many dangerous toils and sin I have already come this
God is so good. I'm 
Denver, great job in worship. Jordan, thank you as well. Uh, just a wonderful experience. Uh, just so you know, this is kind of a, a interesting. So at our house, I don't want this to sound vain or anything, uh, but my son Zeke, our two-year-old, loves to watch the uh, church live stream that we have on YouTube. And so uh, we go in and we'll turn it on and he'll always just say, church, watch church, watch church. And the funniest part about that is I always felt in the beginning like, hey, this is great. My son wanted to watch church. And then sure enough, when we flip over there, he listens to the music, Denver. And then once dad gets up to preach, he's like, uh, baby joy, joy, baby joy, joy. He makes a complete shift right after that. So uh, Zeke is probably tuning out right now at this moment. So anyway, a hey, full disclosure, uh, we are actually shooting this video the night before, uh, but we will post these videos uh, and stream them online coming up uh, at 1040 on Sunday mornings. But uh, all I could think of uh, was that somebody would come up on Sunday morning and then knock on the window and we would let them in, eliminating the whole purpose of, uh, of this isolation idea. And so I just wanted you guys to know, full disclosure, that that was what was going on. Uh, we are so grateful uh, to get to uh, speak with you and, uh, and uh, worship with you. It's also a great picture. God is above all space and time, just like we sung about moments ago. Uh, even though this message has been pre-recorded, and even though the worship has been pre-recorded, our God is so big and so powerful that the Spirit can speak directly to your heart, even right now, uh, in these moments. And so, um, if you got your Bibles, open to uh, Luke chapter 22, and then Acts chapter 16. Luke chapter 22 and Acts chapter 16. We will be continuing our study of the book of uh, Genesis and the story of Joseph starting next week, uh, but this seemed like a week where we needed to move in a little bit different direction. If you would like to go back, and if you have free time, and you'd like to go back and listen to the podcast, feel free to just scroll back through uh, and listen to uh, uh, the series that we've been doing on Joseph, Faithful to Complete. Uh, I think we're about 11 weeks in at this point. It's been a long, uh, but really, really helpful series. If you get a chance, go back and listen to it from the beginning, and we will jump back in uh, to talking about Joseph next week. But this week, uh, this was a different week, something that was kind of unprecedented on a lot of different levels. And so uh, it seemed like it was a time that we could uh, attack just a few different questions. So our start, lesson starts today with this. Have you ever had to go without something that you previously had all the time? Have you ever had to go without something that you previously had all the time? For some of you, that was a restaurant that you loved, a food item that you loved, and then all of a sudden, the restaurant closed down, and you could not have that thing anymore. You go through a period of withdrawal. It's just kind of the way it goes. Or if it's somebody that you spent a lot of time with, and then all of a sudden, you couldn't see them anymore for whatever circumstances, be it for graduation, for taking a new job somewhere else, or because they passed on to be with the Lord. When those moments happen, there are these feelings of great loss, and you have to start a whole new period uh, in your life. I remember for me personally, the first time I really remember analyzing those feelings is because I played football when I was in high school, and from the time I was in the sixth grade to the time I was in the middle of my 12th grade year at the end of the football season, my entire life had centered around those football practices and getting ready uh, to play football. I grew up in Texas, and so football was a really big deal. And uh, I'll never forget, I'm going through all those practices, I'm going through all those games, and then finally, my senior year, when we played in our last football game, I remember being on the football field, and I remember looking up at the stands as they began to empty, and I thought, oh man, what's next? What am I going to do? Through my entire life that I could remember to that point, everything had been about those football practices. And I didn't quite know what to do. I threw myself into work, threw myself into my studies, to spending time with friends. But I can remember all the way up even into college, whenever the fall would come around, I just would feel a bit empty because I wanted to be playing football. Well, my sophomore year in college, um, I went to Oklahoma State University. And my sophomore year in college, I'll never forget, there were some guys passing out literature on a sport called lacrosse. 
out there in the middle of the uh, area in front of the student union. Some of you Stillwater people will know the big clock right there by the classroom building. Go Pokes, by the way. All right. I'll never forget out there. They were having a uh, passing out literature and recruiting for the lacrosse team. Now, it wasn't a Division I team, and uh, I think that the, uh, the reason that they were recruiting is because several people were on probation. But other than that, I mean, I remember walking out there, and they said, do you still have an itch to play college athletics? And I remember in that moment, I got the pamphlet, and I thought, I do. I do have an itch to play college athletics. I do miss those days of practice. And so, for one year and some change, I ended up playing lacrosse at Oklahoma State University. It was so much fun. I had never even touched a lacrosse stick. And uh, without bragging too much, I won the most improved player award on our team that first year that I played. Now, just for the record, our coach, a guy named Jim Hedrick, who had uh, graduated from Navy, Jim Hedrick told me the reason you won is because you could not have gotten any worse. Those are his exact words. I was most improved because I could not have gotten any worse. And against University of Tulsa, I actually scored a goal, only goal of my career, but I scored a goal against University of Tulsa in one of the tournaments that we played against them. I'd gone without that athletic experience, and I really wasn't sure if it was ever going to happen again, but when it did, ah, it was so exciting, and I valued it so much more than I did before. We are in a circumstance right now where we don't know when we're going to get to meet together again, and it's filled me with just such different emotions because, guys, I miss you. I miss spending time with you. Even as we record this, I miss you. I miss being a part of what we're doing together for the kingdom of Almighty God. And we find out in Scripture that Jesus understood that emotion as well. Look with me, if you will, at Luke chapter 22, and we're going to look at verses 14 through 18. These are the same verses that I shared with you in our statement that we would not be meeting on Sunday mornings for the foreseeable future. This is Jesus on the night of the Last Supper. Here's what he says in verse 14. It says, When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table. And Jesus said to them, I have eagerly desired, underline eagerly desired, to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. And after taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, to Take this and divide it amongst you. For I tell you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine again until the kingdom of God comes. Stop right there for just a minute. In this passage, Jesus is about to go to the cross. He's about to suffer for you and for me. His shed blood covering our sins. And the night before, he gathers together with the men that he loves. He gathers together with his closest friends, his disciples, the apostles. And he says to them, I have eagerly desired this moment. I have eagerly desired to be with you. I have looked forward to this moment because it'll be a while before we get to do it again. This idea of eagerly desire, I think, could best be explained through the attitude of most dogs. Some of you have dogs, all right? Some of you have cats. I mean, the opposite of this is explained through cats, all right? Uh, think about it. When you leave for some time, and you come home to your cat, the cat's attitude is pretty much, you left, I was fine without you. You know what I mean? That's kind of the attitude of a cat, all right? They just live, they just do their own thing. Eagerly expecting something is your dog. The dog is the one that sits at the window, if you let the dog inside the house, and they sit at the window and they wait for you, eagerly expecting for you to come back, watching, waiting, wishing that you will walk through that door and that you will spend time with them. That's the word that we get here for the Son of God. He says to the disciples, I am not emotionally disconnected from this circumstance. He said, I eagerly desired for this moment. I look forward to gathering together with you. And the thought that it's going to be some time does fill me with a bit of sadness. If you're taking notes, write this down. When we gather together to worship, we get a glimpse of heaven. Let me say that again. When we gather together to worship, we get a glimpse of heaven. That is something that I always heard said over the years. But this week, this week, it makes so much more sense than it did before. When we gather together to worship Almighty God, it's a glimpse of what eternity will be like. It's a glimpse of what we will get to do forever, praising the name of the creator of the universe. 
the hope of the ages, proclaiming that he saved us and that we can be in perfect love because of him. It begs our big million dollar question today because we live in a time of great fear and now isolation to the point that the church cannot even gather together corporately. So our big million dollar question is this. How does a disciple navigate fear and isolation? How does a disciple navigate fear and isolation? Well, praise God, we are not the first people in history to navigate this. And we get a template for how to navigate it in Acts chapter 16, verses 22 through 34. Flip, me, flip with me, if you will, to Acts chapter 16, and we're going to start in verse 22, attacking this idea of fear and isolation. If you are watching this feed today and you are feeling this way, this is a great opportunity for you to take notes. And if you're watching this feed and you'd say, you know what, I'm doing pretty good for now, who knows? Maybe we are watching this 12 months into the future again and remembering uh, these truths because they are timeless. Look with me, if you will, at Acts 16, starting in verse 22. Now, here's what's happened leading up to this point. Paul and a guy named Silas, two early church planters, are uh, going around and they're preaching the gospel. And in one city, all of a sudden, Paul and Silas are preaching the gospel. And there is a woman who is demon-possessed that comes up to them. She begins to say some things. And then Paul and Silas cast the demon out of this woman. And all of a sudden, she begins to settle in and she begins to worship Almighty God. The problem is there were people making good money off of her being demon-possessed. They had a vested interest in her not finding a relationship with Almighty God. And all of a sudden, they begin to turn the crowd against Paul and Silas, and they start to try to get them thrown in prison. Look at what happens in Acts chapter 16, verse 22. It says, The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas. And the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten. And after they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison. And the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. Look at this in verse 24. It says, upon receiving such orders, he put them in the inner cell, underline inner cell, and he fastened their feet in the stocks, underline fastened their feet in the stocks. Stop right there for just a minute. If there is not fear and isolation uh, before, you can certainly see it here. They are isolated in the inner cell, and their feet and hands and head are placed in the stocks. The stocks were that thing that they would clamp down on top of you. It's incredibly uncomfortable. You're completely immobilized. So they have got to be because they've been stripped and beaten as they're naked in the stocks. I'm telling you, fear has taken hold of Paul and Silas. Not only that, they've been isolated in the inner cell, solitary confinement for the two of them. They don't know at this point if they're going to even get to see another day. They could be killed. So how do they respond to fear and isolation? Verse 25 is so powerful. Look at this. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. Look at this. And the other prisoners were listening to them. Now stop right there for just a minute. I love that it says about midnight. Do you know why about midnight is important? Because that lets us know, most likely, that was not their immediate response. About midnight, when the fear has subsided, or has just at least dipped low enough that they can think straight. About midnight, when the other prisoners have gotten quiet. About midnight, when the bulk of the crowd that put them in prison has gone away. All of a sudden, fear and isolation... Paul looks at Silas and says, let's start singing. Let's sing praise to Almighty God. Let's pray, just like we read about in Philippians chapter 4 that Paul would write later. He says, let's pray and let's sing hymns to Almighty God. If you're taking notes, write this down. How does a disciple navigate fear and isolation? Number one, by singing songs of praise. By singing songs of praise. Now, over the year in ministry... There have always been a grouping of people, and by the way, D.C. is infamous for this. There have always been a group of people that say, I don't know about the whole song portion of the worship service. I don't know, why do we do this whole song thing? In fact, people will regularly say to me, I wish we could skip straight to the sermon. Now, I used to see that as like hero worship, like, yeah, I'm, I'm the best, you know, and that's not the picture there. Singing songs for some people 
it's very uncomfortable to them. But remember this, singing songs is something that cuts us directly to our core. When you have a song that you proclaim with your mouth, It is not just the world that is listening to you. Listen to this. You are listening to yourself with the words that come out of your mouth. To sing those songs of praise is to remind ourselves who God is. And that is a very, very powerful thing. It's one thing to read it. It's another thing to hear someone else say it. But for it to come out of your own mouth is a very powerful thing. If you're taking notes, a little quote here for you. Do not underestimate the effects of singing to God, the effects singing to God can have on your heart's condition. Let me say that again. Do not underestimate the effect singing to God can have on your heart's condition. For any of you gripped by incredible fear, I want to encourage you. Just start singing. It might, by the way, be confined in your house. It might be in your car. That is one of my favorite places to belt out and to sing, along with a bunch of other people who have been captured on cell phone videos, all right? I'm telling you, we sing, and when we let it go, then there are really cool things that can happen within our hearts as well. It's remembering, when it comes to God, who God is and the promises he's made. He places places a song in our heart that we proclaim with our mouth. I was trying to think through the time that I've been the most afraid in my entire life. And easily it has to be when our daughter Lulu had her very first ever seizure. Several, uh, in fact, there are many of you that may be watching um, that were here when we experienced going through all those different emotions. It was uh, the last day of the year in 2016. And uh, I remember... Um, anybody will tell you seizures you begin to learn how to navigate them but there is nothing scarier than the first one because you do not expect it to show up I'll never forget our sweet daughter Lulu six years old at that point and uh, we were about to get on a plane I was supposed to go preach in California and uh, we were about to get on a plane fly to California from DC to California across the coast from coast to coast and uh, I'll never forget We're about to get on the plane, and we were going to take the kids to Disneyland while we were out there. I was going to preach during the evenings, but we were going to get to take the kids to Disneyland a couple of those days. We are just hours before we take off, and we're at our house, and we were trying to get Lulu to take a nap before we got on the plane. And so I'm laying down on the bed watching TV. She's laying down next to me, and then all of a sudden, I feel that she has, I think, wet the bed at that point. Well, I look over at her. And she also has thrown up. And so I just went, oh, no, we were about to get on the plane. I said, oh, no, Lulu, this isn't like you. And I begin to stand her up, but she just looks a bit dazed. We start to get her towards the shower so that we can get her cleaned off. And then all of a sudden, she shoots out, and her arms and fingertips shoot out like tree branches. And she has a seizure. We didn't know what was happening But she had basically expelled an entire day's worth of energy right there in those moments. And then all of a sudden, she collapses to the floor. We had called the police in the middle of this process, called the ambulance. And the EMTs had shown up at the house very, very quickly. But Lulu is unconscious, and we're trying to wake her up. But we just see her lifeless on the ground. I remember, again, I pick her up, and the EMT said, can you carry her to the ambulance? I picked her up, and I began to carry her through, and she's just completely unresponsive. We set her down on the cot, and I remember we're in the ambulance together. And the EMTs don't know if we've done something to cause this seizure within her, if we've been abusive to her. And so it's always very, very quiet. And all of a sudden, I just was filled with such fear because I thought, what if she doesn't wake up? What if she doesn't wake up? What if this is her life now? What if, we, what if we just experience the last moments with her? And I'm telling you, I just begin to softly cry. The tears begin to pour down my cheeks as we sit silently in that ambulance. There was nothing I could do. I was afraid, and I could not have felt more isolated. Also, my wife, we had two other kids at that, but we had two other kids at that point. And my wife had to stay with them, so I am by myself with Lulu in the ambulance. I remember I just kept praying, God, let her wake up. Please, God, let her wake up. Please let her wake up. We get to the hospital. I think probably the scariest moment is when they took the IV, they put it into her arm, and blood shot out of her arm, and she didn't even flinch. She was still completely and totally unconscious. 
It was at that point, I remember just feeling so out of control. And I began to think I just need to sing to God. I'm in the middle of the emergency room. And the song that came to mind was one of the first songs that I ever memorized when I was in the youth group when I was a kid. A man named Rich Mullins, who was a worship leader. And Rich Mullins wrote a song called Sometimes by Step of all the songs. And I remember sitting there with my daughter. And I just began to sing, oh, God, you are my God. And I will ever praise you. I will seek you in the morning and I will learn to walk in your ways and step by step. You'll lead me, and I will follow you all of my days. Before that was Rich Mullins, that was David that wrote that. Oh God, you are my God. Seems redundant. But what you are proclaiming to God Almighty is, Lord, I know that you are in charge. Lord, I know that you hold this situation in the palm of your hand. And even though I feel so out of control, I know that you are sovereign. So I sang, and four hours after she had the seizure, her sweet little brown eyes opened, and she woke back up. When you go through times of great fear and isolation, find a song that proclaims the greatness of Almighty God, and then let Him have it. You don't have to do it on the live feed. You don't have to do it on the online worship service. You can do it at any time, wherever you are. When you've got the earbuds in, or man, whether you just are blaring it out, having fun at your apartment or at your house. Man, you can sing to God any time. And what we proclaim with our mouth, we hear with our own ears at the same time. By the way, the psalmist writes this in Psalm chapter 89. Let's look at verses 1 and 2. Here's what Psalm chapter 89 has to say. Starting in verse 1, the psalmist writes here, I will sing of the Lord's great love forever. With my mouth, I will make known your faithfulness throughout all generations. I will declare that your love stands firm forever, that you establish your faithfulness in heaven itself. There is something powerful about what we proclaim with our mouth. It's the reason in Romans chapter 10, verse 9, it says, If you confess what? With your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. There is a connection between what you say and what you believe in your heart. And if what you are saying over and over again is fear, 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 hopelessness, 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 then don't be surprised when it makes its way down to infect your heart. It begs the question today, what are you saying? What are you saying? That God is in control or that there is no hope? You are listening to yourself. What are you speaking into your own life? Remember the words of the psalmist. With my mouth, I will make known your faithfulness. When has God been faithful to you? When has God been faithful to you? Remember those moments and know that he will do it throughout the generations. But that's not the end of our story. Look at what happens next. Flip back over to Acts chapter 16 and let's look at verses 26 through 28. So they're singing and by the way, the other prisoners are listening to them. If you are a Christian going through this coronavirus crisis, did you know people are watching you? And if you scream and stir fear and panic, then they are going to remember that the people of God who claimed God to be sovereign and in complete control, that they stirred fear and panic. That with your mouth, you might have proclaimed one thing, but with your actions and attitude, you proclaimed another. Look at what happens next. Everybody's watching them as they sing praise and pray to Almighty God. Verse 26, and then suddenly there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, all the prison doors flew open and everybody's chains came loose. Now the jailer woke up and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself. We are all here. Circle, highlight, and underline, we are all here. Now, to understand what's just happened in this circumstance, you got to know the history 
of the way it is to be a jailer or a warden, a prison warden during this time period. The Roman government had made a rule that whoever the prison warden was was responsible for the lives of the prisoners to the point that if a prisoner escaped, then the warden had to give their life in exchange for the life of the prisoner that got away. So an earthquake happens in the middle of the worship service. In the middle of them singing hymns and praise to Almighty God, the prison doors swing open. And when the prison doors swing open, I don't know about you, but in my little world, I would have gone, I felt wrongfully accused from the beginning here. Um, the prison doors have just swung open uh, via an earthquake. I'm getting out of here as a sign from Almighty God that it's time for me to go. This is before the time of fingerprinting, before the time of facial recognition software. They could have just walked right out and taken care of themselves. But listen. If even one prisoner escapes, the jailer is dead. With Paul and Silas, the future is uncertain. For the Christians, the direct day after is uncertain. But for the jailer, the jailer could lose everything in that moment. When it comes to panic around a pandemic or anything in your life, there is more going on than just you. Do you hear me? There is more going on than just you. If you're taking notes, write this down. How does the disciple navigate fear and isolation? Number one, by singing songs of praise. And number two, by living selflessly. By living selflessly. If you don't take anything else away from today, I hope you take this piece. When the world is shaken... We must learn to look beyond ourself. Let me say that again. When the world is shaken, we must learn to look beyond ourself. You see, Paul and Silas are filled with fear, but the jailer, terrified. The moment he is in is truly one of the most important of his entire life. And Paul, instead of saying, You're on your own, bro, you're on your own. I'm taking care of me. God's provided for me, and I'm going to take care of me. Instead, Paul keeps his head. He realizes the jailer's dire straits and says, Hey, we're all here. Nobody's moving. From the mouth of the man who'd been singing praise at midnight, he said, Nobody's moving. This action that God has done maybe wasn't just to set me free. Maybe it was to set the jailer free from his prison of sin. When the world is shaken, we must learn to look beyond ourselves. Isolation makes you crazy. You need to know that. Isolation makes you crazy. The more time you spend alone, the weirder stuff that you the weird stuff that you begin to justify. I got to go yesterday to the grocery store. And the grocery store I was in was jam-packed with people. And the people were afraid. They were nervous, filling shopping carts full of stuff. In fact, I saw one woman next to the rice aroni of all things. She put her arm out and scooted everything that was on the shelf into her cart. Everyone was nervous. There were shopping carts that had been abandoned all throughout the grocery store aisles. And I'm telling you, we're trying to weave in and out. And then, God bless her, there was a woman who was working at this particular grocery store, and she yelled out so that everyone could hear, the boss says when it's all gone, we can go home. She yelled out, when the boss says it's all gone, we can go home. Now that did not inspire courage, I can promise you that. All of a sudden, people began to move even more frantically. And even as a Christ follower, I thought, is this it? Is this our last chance to gather supplies before something is about to go down? And here's what happened. My cart began to come head on with another man's cart in our community who was right next to me. There's another big cart that had been abandoned on the side. And here we are at a standoff. And I'm looking around frantically. And I'll never forget this. This man was an agent of peace. He stopped. He looked me square in the eye. And he said, you can go. And he backed up his cart. He didn't look around. He wasn't acting in frantic by nature. 
He looked me in the eye, acknowledged my humanity, and reminded me at my core who I was as well. I looked at him and I said, thank you, sir. I pushed around and then it was contagious. Selflessness is contagious. When we remember who we are in Jesus Christ, all of a sudden it changes us. That one interaction, that one human interaction, looking one another in the eye and realizing God is in control. We didn't even share the gospel with one another in that moment, and yet it became so clear in my life. When you get isolated, you get stinking selfish. You think it's all about you because you're all you experience. You're all you see. We've got to come to a point where we remember when fear and isolation hit us, the world is still beyond our walls. There are still people out there who need our help. If you're taking notes, write this down. Has, or, here's the question. Has isolation made you crazy and selfish? There are some of you watching this that need to share what you have. Share what you have. If God has blessed you with an abundance, there are people all around you who are hurting. There are people all around you who are without. Maybe it's a roll of toilet paper. To quote the great Elaine from Seinfeld, maybe you spare a square, right? Maybe you share. For some of you, it might be food. But share with one another. When we do, it's us saying, I believe that God is going to take care of both of us. And I refuse to be trapped in fear. For some of you, you may not have the extra stuff to share. But you certainly have the words of your mouth. You certainly have the words that you can type, text, or post with your fingertips. I want to encourage you. What if you passed on encouraging words because that's what God has given you to share? Has isolation made you crazy and selfish? I got the antibiotic. Trust God and begin to live beyond yourself. But then we have the close to the passage. And the closing of this is the best part. The jailer has pulled his sword and is about to kill himself. Paul says, don't harm yourself. We're all here. Nobody's going nowhere. We're sticking around. We see beyond our circumstances, and we're going to do what's best to help you. And then all of a sudden, just like that situation in the supermarket for me, the jailer goes through a moment where all of a sudden the revival and selflessness spreads, spreads to him as well. Look at verse 29. It says, then the jailer called for the lights and rushed in and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Stop right there for just a minute. He's not talking about saved from his circumstances. He's asking them about eternal life. He had heard them just like the other prisoners singing praise to Almighty God. He'd heard them praying. He knew the reason that they had been brought in because they were stirring spiritual revolution in the city. And he looks at them and says, sirs, what do I have to do to be saved? Saved means eternity with God in heaven instead of eternity separated from God in hell. What do I have to do for my sin to not be counted against me? He looks at him and says, give me my to-do list. Show me what to do so that I can be like you, so that I can have this peace that you have, so I can be forgiven. We always say at our church, what's the million dollar question? This is the trillion dollar question. This is the one that it is all about for eternity. What do we have to do to spend eternity with God in heaven instead of eternity separated from him in hell? Look at Acts 16, 31. It says, they replied, meaning that it is not Paul's theology, that it is the theology. They replied, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved, you and your whole household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and all others in his household. And at that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately he and his family were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house, set a meal before them, and he was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole family. What we find in this passage, what do I have to do to be saved? Paul and Silas cry out, it's about Jesus. Know with certainty that Jesus is who he claimed to be. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you shall be saved. And not just you, but it's a gospel for your whole house as well. It says he receives the message. He receives Jesus. And then we find out, he goes, you got to tell my family. Let's bring them in. He takes them to his own house, cleans up their wounds. Because remember, they'd been stripped and beaten earlier in the day. 
He sets a meal before them. You realize they're still his prisoner, right? It makes the passage even more powerful. You could almost take this image that you got two beat up naked dudes sharing the gospel with the warden. He takes them. It doesn't matter how they look on the outside. The message that they share is so powerful is so life-changing that he is begging them, please give me the truth. And they said his name is Jesus. If you're taking notes, write this down. How does a disciple navigate fear and isolation? Number one, by singing songs of praise. Number two, by living selflessly. And number three, by talking about Jesus. By talking about Jesus. Even if you are isolated and afraid, There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power that flows even by speaking his name. It's the reason that the enemy wants you isolated so that you can't be reminded of that piece of truth any longer. There is power in the name of Jesus. After my father passed away, I went through a stretch where I was having nightmares, heavy Brutal nightmares, and they were different but the same. It always just ended up with my father passing away. He was a spiritual giant in my life. And for over a month, I had these nightmares that were just absolutely terrorizing me. I'll never forget, I met with a pastor in Southeast D.C., Pastor Fitz. When I met with Pastor Fitz, I told him about what was going on. He said, man, you don't look well. He goes, there's bags under your eyes. You don't look well. You look so tired. And I said, since dad died, I keep having these awful dreams. He said, young man, he said, the dream world is much like the normal world. I said, what do you mean? He said, the name of Jesus has power in both. He said, what do you do when you're so afraid in those dreams? I said, I just try to make it through. He said, what if you began to call out the name of Jesus? I said, even in my dreams, he said, you might as well try. He said, Does, do we not believe our God has dominion even over our thoughts? I said, you know what? I'll try it. I'd try anything at that point. You know what was nuts? I began to call out the name of Jesus when I had those dreams, in those moments where it seemed dire and unfixable. And the name of Jesus would wake me up. And I would realize that it was just a thought. It was not reality All of a sudden, it begins to spill over into other things as well. These moments that you feel pain or panic or frustration, just to call out the name of Jesus is a reminder to us that he is with us, he is for us, and that he is, again, the author of our hope. He's the reason that we don't have to live afraid. If you're taking notes, write this down. Fear cannot find footing when the name of Jesus is present. Let me say that again. Fear cannot find footing when the name of Jesus is present. If you are listening today and you are struck by fear, I want to encourage you. Speak the name of Jesus. It's a name filled with power. And then for some of you, you're interacting with people that are scared, that are fear-filled, that are struggling. I want to encourage you. Speak the name of Jesus to those people. Speak the name of Jesus in conversation. Speak the name of Jesus over them in prayer and watch the enemy begin to flee. It begs our final question today. Easily the most important. Do you believe in Jesus? Do you know with certainty that he is who God claimed for him to be? That he's the son of God, that he died on the cross that he rose from the dead, and that he alone is that perfect sacrifice for all our sin. Our hope is in him. He is the author and perfecter of our faith, Scripture says. Do you believe in Jesus? If so, then you have hope, and it's going to be all right. Without him, it doesn't matter if there's coronavirus or if it's a time of incredible blessing. Without Jesus, in the end, you lose. He's the only way that we can find salvation for eternity. I love you guys. Thank you so much for listening today. Don't tune out. The best part of the service are these next few moments. If you wouldn't mind bowing your head and closing your eyes just for a moment. Here at our church, we call this our time of reflection. There's nothing mystical or magical about this time. 
It's just a chance for us to stop and to process how we're different because of the songs we've sung, the sermon we've heard, and specifically the scripture that we've read. The guys are going to be coming up again to play just softly behind in the background. As they do that, I'd like to lead you through a time again of reflection. With nobody looking around, if you take just a moment, is there anybody watching that would say, Zach, I need to start singing songs of praise. What's been coming out of my mouth, what's been going into my ears is negativity, it's hopelessness, and it's the lie that everything is completely out of control. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, it is not out of control. We believe that God is sovereign over all, in all, and through all. If that's you, I would just like to ask you where you are to just give me a nod. If that's you, or lift your hand, I'd just like to pray for you. I'm going to pray for you, but if that was you, make the commitment today that you are going to mark out some time to sing songs of praise to Almighty God. We hope that it will be on Sunday mornings right here at 1040 when we worship together, but that you'll mark out some time. Second, maybe there are some of you that would say, Zach, would you pray for me? I have not been living selflessly. I'm one of the ones who either in my mind or with my actions was pushing all the riceroni into the cart. If that's you and you'd say, would you pray for me? I want to live beyond myself. I want to live and remember that God is in control and that I need to share what it is that I have. With nobody looking around but just me, it doesn't mean you need to run to the food bank and drop everything off. Maybe it just means that you listen to your neighbors, that you listen to your friends and family. And if there's something they lack, you would say, God, it belongs to you. And what you have given me, I will share. If that's you, I'd like to ask you just to lift your hand where you are right now. If you lifted your hand, I'm going to pray for you. But your simple prayer is this. God, it belongs to you. It does not belong to me. God, it belongs to you. And I will share. And then last but not least, maybe there are some of you here that would say, Zach, I need to be saved. I need to believe in Jesus for the very first time. If that's you, just know you don't have to be in person to make that decision. Scripture says, again, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you shall be saved. You can be saved right here, right now, in this moment, no matter when you're watching this video. God is not subject to space and time. If that's you, and you would say, I need to believe in Jesus for the very first time, if you would just lift your hand where you are right now, made that decision you need to tell somebody right there in the comment section type I am believing in Jesus right here right now in this moment type it in confess it with your mouth confess it with your fingertips so that we can know just for the record there are no secret agent Christians it's something that we have to share let us know and then we're going to reach out to you this week and check up on you and then last but not least Maybe you already believe in Jesus, but you'd say, it's about time I started speaking his name again. It's about time I started sharing that hope with others. If that's you, I'd like to invite you just to raise your hand where you are right now. Thank you for doing that. If that's you, I'm going to pray for you, but your simple prayer is, God, give me courage to speak the name. God, give me courage to speak the name. When the nightmares come, the name of Jesus is all-powerful. When the fear hits and it grips us in the gut, the name of Jesus is all-powerful. When we have those moments where we feel sick, or we feel concerned, or we feel in physical pain, the name of Jesus is where we can grab our hope. I love you guys. Thank you so much for listening today. I'm going to pray for us. And then we've got two amazing songs of worship. It seemed like if we were going to do a service and talk about singing songs of praise, we might as well give you a little bit more time to do it. I'm going to pray for us, and then where you are at your house, at your apartment, at work, wherever, if you would stand and belt out these next two songs of praise. Father, thank you for this day and for your blessings in it. Thank you so much for the example of Paul and Silas. And Lord, thank you 
that we are able to worship without borders. That even though we cannot meet together corporately, we can still gather as the body of believers, as the church, to cry out to you with one voice. Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ for those who are here today who need to start saying with their mouth the truths of Scripture. They need to begin singing out to you so that they can hear their own voice and remember that you are in charge and in control. Give them a double portion of courage today and let them find margin in their day to sing to you. Lord, I also pray for those who feel called to live selflessly beyond themselves. Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ, you would give them opportunities to share before the sun goes down today. And Lord, I do pray that you would give them a double blessing as they go through it. And God, for those who need to be saved, fill them with your great courage. Help them to reach out and right now on that page, right now on that email to reach out to us and let us know about their decision. And God, for those who just need to speak the name, there is power in the name of Jesus. Thank you, God, that it is truly that simple. There is nothing we could ever do to get to you on our own. But you and your perfect wisdom and kindness, you sent your son for us. Thank you, God, for who you are. Speak in power in these final moments. It's in the mighty name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Let's stand together. Denver, it's all yours. I was
Jesus, we're so thankful again. We get to worship you. In the midst of the storm, as we rejoice in the Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Heck of a job, dude. Heck of a job. We build our lives around the firm foundation, Jesus Christ. What a powerful word for us here at the end. Um, man, great job, guys. I'm looking forward to spending some time with you uh, in here with a good three-foot distance between us, okay? It's going to be good, uh, but uh, spending some time. We will be here every single week, okay, at 1040 a.m. is when the service will go up, on, uh, go up uh, online, and uh, just know we look forward to spending time with you. Now, just a little business. We will need help with giving. Just know we still have a, a leases that we have got to take care of, uh, and God has blessed us. We have some money in the reserve, but we are still very, very much contingent uh, upon you continuing to give and to help us so that we can continue doing ministry. And so um, we have got several ways that you can give, just so you know. One is to give online through waterfrontchurchdc.com backslash give. That is a wonderful way, again, for you to connect with us through online giving. Um, and you can also text to give through the number 202-750-3301. Uh, or you can also send us a check by mail uh, to P.O. Box 70666. Yes, we have a 666 P.O. Box, all right? Uh, and uh, Washington, D.C., 20024. Thank you again so much uh, for worshiping with us today. One more bit of information is we are going to be meeting for our small groups virtually uh, through something called WebEx. And so if you are interested uh, in uh, connecting with us so that uh, you can be a part of one of these small group meetings, um, it actually is more personal than you would think. And so it's a great way for us to stay connected to each other. Email ed at waterfrontchurchdc.com, and he will get you plugged in to one of those virtual small groups. Thank you, guys. I'm going to pray for us, and then you'll get some instructions here at the end. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you that your love is a firm foundation. Thank you for taking care of us. And Lord, we thank you that you are not limited by space and time, but that you are so big, so sovereign, so powerful, that no matter where we are, you hear us. Love you, Lord. Take care of us this week. Help us to look beyond ourselves and to speak the name of Jesus every time we can. It's in his holy name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for watching this morning's services. I genuinely look forward to the time uh, when we get to worship together in person again. Uh, but until then, our best form of contact is going to be through the internet. If you need someone to pray with you, please email pastor at waterfrontchurchdc.com. If you are hungry and in need of some canned food in the midst of this coronavirus pandemic, please email amber at waterfrontchurchdc.com. If you are interested in joining uh, one of our online community groups, please email ed at waterfrontchurchdc.com. And then, most importantly, if you need to be saved, Please email as soon as this video completes, tj at waterfrontchurchdc.com. You will not make a better decision in your lifetime. Thank you so much, and we will see you next week.